I was to dine with the Mannerings that night and had barely time to canter home to dress. On the road to Elysium Hill I overheard two men talking together in the dusk, it's a curious thing, said one, how completely all trace of it disappeared. You know my wife was insanely fond of the woman, never could see anything in her myself, and wanted me to pick up her old rickshaw and coolies if they were to be got for love or money. Morbid sort of fancy I call it but I've got to do what the memsahib tells me. Would you believe that the man she hired it from tells me that all four of the men, they were brothers, died of cholera, on the way to Hardwar, poor devils, and the rickshaw has been broken up by the man himself. Told me he never used a dead memsahib's rickshaw. Spoilt his luck. Queer notion, wasn't it? Fancy poor little Mrs. Wessington spoiling anyone's luck except her own. I laughed aloud at this point, and my laugh jarred on me as I uttered it. So there were ghosts of rickshaws after all, and ghostly employments in the other world. How much did Mrs. Wessington give her men? What were their hours? Where did they go? And for visible answer to my last question I saw the infernal thing blocking my path in the twilight. The dead travel fast and by shortcuts unknown to ordinary coolies. I laughed aloud a second time and checked my laughter suddenly, for I was afraid I was going mad. Mad to a certain extent I must have been, for I recollect that I reined in my horse at the head of the rickshaw, and politely wished Mrs. Wessington good evening. Her answer was one I knew only too well. I listened to the end, and replied that I had heard it all before, but should be delighted if she had anything further to say. Some malignant devil stronger than I must have entered into me that evening, for I have a dim recollection of talking the commonplaces of the day for five minutes to the thing in front of me. Mad as a hatter, poor devil, or drunk. Max, try and get him to come home. Surely that was not Mrs. Wessington's voice. The two men had overheard me speaking to the empty air, and had returned to look after me. They were very kind and considerate, and from their words evidently gathered that I was extremely drunk. I thanked them confusedly and cantered away to my hotel, there changed, and arrived at the Mannerings ten minutes late. I pleaded the darkness of the night as an excuse, was rebuked by Kitty for my unlover-like tardiness, and sat down. The conversation had already become general, and, under cover of it, I was addressing some tender small talk to my sweetheart when I was aware that at the further end of the table a short red-whiskered man was describing with much broidery his encounter with a mad unknown that evening. A few sentences convinced me that he was repeating the incident of half an hour ago. In the middle of the story he looked round for applause, as professional storytellers do, caught my eye, and straightway collapsed. There was a moment's awkward silence and the red-whiskered man muttered something to the effect that he had forgotten the rest, thereby sacrificing a reputation as a good storyteller which he had built up for six seasons past. I blessed him from the bottom of my heart and went on with my fish. In the fullness of time that dinner came to an end, and with genuine regret I tore myself away from Kitty, as certain as I was of my own existence that it would be waiting for me outside the door. The red-whiskered man, who had been introduced to me as Dr. Heatherleg of Simla, volunteered to bear me company as far as our roads lay together. I accepted his offer with gratitude. My instinct had not deceived me. It lay in readiness in the mall, and, in what seemed devilish mockery of our ways, with a lighted headlamp. The red-whiskered man went to the point at once, in a manner that showed he had been thinking over it all dinner time. I say, Pansy, what the deuce was the matter with you this evening on the Elysium Road? The suddenness of the question wrenched an answer from me before I was aware. That, said I, pointing to it. That may be either DT or eyes for aught I know. 
Now you don't liquor. I saw as much at dinner, so it can't be DT. There's nothing whatever where you're pointing, though you're sweating and trembling with fright like a scared pony. Therefore, I conclude that it's eyes. And I ought to understand all about them. Come along home with me. I'm on the Blessington Lower Road. To my intense delight the rickshaw instead of waiting for us kept about twenty yards ahead, and this, too, whether we walked, trotted, or cantered. In the course of that long night ride I had told my companion almost as much as I have told you here. Well, you've spoilt one of the best tales I've ever laid tongue to, said he. But I'll forgive you for the sake of what you've gone through. Now come home and do what I tell you, and when I've cured you, young man, let this be a lesson to you to steer clear of women and indigestible food till the day of your death. The rickshaw kept steadily in front, and my red-whiskered friend seemed to derive great pleasure from my account of its exact whereabouts. Eyes, pansy, all eyes, brain and stomach, and the greatest of these three is stomach. You've too much conceited brain, too little stomach, and thoroughly unhealthy eyes. Get your stomach straight and the rest follows. And all that's French for a liver pill. I'll take sole medical charge of you from this hour, for you're too interesting a phenomenon to be passed over. By this time we were deep in the shadow of the Blessington Lower Road and the rickshaw came to a dead stop under a pine-clad, overhanging shale cliff. Instinctively I halted too, giving my reason. Heatherleg rapped out an oath. Now, if you think I'm going to spend a cold night on the hillside for the sake of a stomach come brain come I illusion. Lord hop mercy. What's that? There was a muffled report, a blinding smother of dust just in front of us, a crack, the noise of rent boughs, and about ten yards of the cliffside, pines, undergrowth, and all, slid down into the road below, completely blocking it up. The uprooted trees swayed and tottered for a moment like drunken giants in the gloom, and then fell prone among their fellows with a thunderous crash. Our two horses stood motionless and sweating with fear. As soon as the rattle of falling earth and stone had subsided, my companion muttered, Man, if we'd gone forward we should have been ten feet deep in our graves by now. There are more things in heaven and earth. Come home, Pansy, and thank God. I want a drink badly. We retraced our way over the church ridge, and I arrived at Dr. Heatherlegger's house shortly after midnight. His attempts towards my cure commenced almost immediately, and for a week I never left his sight. Many a time in the course of that week did I bless the good fortune which had thrown me in contact with Simla's best and kindest doctor. Day by day my spirits grew lighter and more equable. Day by day, too, I became more and more inclined to fall in with Heatherlegger's spectral illusion theory, implicating eyes, brain, and stomach. I wrote to Kitty, telling her that a slight sprain caused by a fall from my horse kept me indoors for a few days, and that I should be recovered before she had time to regret my absence. Heatherlegger's treatment was simple to a degree. It consisted of liver pills, cold water baths and strong exercise, taken in the dusk or at early dawn, for, as he sagely observed, a man with a sprained ankle doesn't walk a dozen miles a day, and your young woman might be wondering if she saw you. At the end of the week, after much examination of pupil and pulse and strict injunctions as to diet and pedestrianism, Heatherleg dismissed me as brusquely as he had taken charge of me. Here is his parting benediction, man, I certify to your mental cure, and that's as much as to say I've cured most of your bodily ailments. Now, get your traps out of this as soon as you can, and be off to make love to Miss Kitty. I was endeavoring to express my thanks for his kindness. He cut me short. Don't think I did this because I like you. I gather that you've behaved like a blackguard all through. But, all the same you're a phenomenon, and as queer a phenomenon as you are a blackguard. Now, go out and see if you can find the eyes brain and stomach business again. I'll give you a lack for each time you see it. Half an hour later I was in the Mannerings drawing room with Kitty, 
drunk with the intoxication of present happiness and the foreknowledge that I should never more be troubled with its hideous presence. Strong in the sense of my newfound security, I proposed a ride at once, and, by preference, a canter round Jacko. Never have I felt so well, so overladen with vitality and mere animal spirits as I did on the afternoon of the 30th of April. Kitty was delighted at the change in my appearance, and complimented me on it in her delightfully frank and outspoken manner. We left the Mannering's house together, laughing and talking, and cantered along the Chota Simla road as of old. I was in haste to reach the Sanjoli Reservoir and there make my assurance doubly sure. The horses did their best, but seemed all too slow to my impatient mind. Kitty was astonished at my boisterousness. Why, Jack, she cried at last, you are behaving like a child. What are you doing? We were just below the convent, and from sheer wantonness I was making my whaler plunge and curvet across the road as I tickled it with the loop of my riding whip. Doing, I answered, nothing, dear. That's just it. If you'd been doing nothing for a week except lie up, you'd be as riotous as I. Singing and murmuring in your feastful mirth, joying to feel yourself alive. Lord over nature, Lord of the visible earth, Lord of the senses five. My quotation was hardly out of my lips before we had rounded the corner above the convent, and a few yards further on could see across to Sanjali. In the center of the level road stood the black and white liveries, the yellow-paneled rickshaw and Mrs. Keith Wessington. I pulled up, looked, rubbed my eyes, and, I believe, must have said something. The next thing I knew was that I was lying face downward on the road, with Kitty kneeling above me in tears. Has it gone, child? I gasped. Kitty only wept more bitterly. Has what gone? Jack dear, what does it all mean? There must be a mistake somewhere, Jack. A hideous mistake. Her last words brought me to my feet, mad, raving for the time being. Yes, there is a mistake somewhere. I repeated, a hideous mistake. Come and look at it. I have an indistinct idea that I dragged Kitty by the wrist along the road up to where it stood, and implored her for pity's sake to speak to it, to tell it that we were betrothed. That neither death nor hell could break the tie between us, and Kitty only knows how much more to the same effect. Now and again I appealed passionately to the terror in the rickshaw to bear witness to all I had said, and to release me from a torture that was killing me. As I talked I suppose I must have told Kitty of my old relations with Mrs. Wessington, for I saw her listen intently with white face and blazing eyes. Thank you, Mr. Pansy, she said, that's quite enough. Bring my horse. The grooms, impassive as Orientals always are, had come up with the recaptured horses, and as Kitty sprang into her saddle I caught hold of the bridle entreating her to hear me out and forgive. My answer was the cut of her riding whip across my face from mouth to eye, and a word or two of farewell that even now I cannot write down. So I judged, and judged rightly, that Kitty knew all. And I staggered back to the side of the rickshaw. My face was cut and bleeding, and the blow of the riding whip had raised a livid blue will on it. I had no self-respect. Just then, Heatherleg, who must have been following Kitty and me at a distance, cantered up. Doctor, I said, pointing to my face, here's Miss Mannering's signature to my order of dismissal and. I'll thank you for that lack as soon as convenient. Heatherleg's face, even in my abject misery, moved me to laugh. I'll stake my professional reputation, he began. Don't be a fool, I whispered. I've lost my life's happiness and you'd better take me home. As I spoke the rickshaw was gone. Then I lost all knowledge of what was passing. The crest of Jacko seemed to heave and roll like the crest of a cloud and fall in upon me. Seven days later, on the 7th of May, that is to say, I was aware that I was lying in Heatherleg's room as weak as a little child. Heatherleg was watching me intently from behind the papers on his writing table. 
His first words were not very encouraging, but I was too far spent to be much moved by them. Here's Miss Kitty has sent back your letters. You corresponded a good deal, you young people. Here's a packet that looks like a ring, and a cheerful sort of a note from Mannering Papa, which I've taken the liberty of reading and burning. The old gentleman's not pleased with you. And Kitty? I asked Dolly. Rather more drawn than her father from what she says. By the same token you must have been letting out any number of queer reminiscences just before I met you. Says that a man who would have behaved to a woman as you did to Mrs. Wessington ought to kill himself out of sheer pity for his kind. She's a hot-headed little virago, your mash. We'll have it too that you were suffering from DT when that row on the Jacko Road turned up. Says she'll die before she ever speaks to you again. I groaned and turned over on the other side. Now you've got your choice, my friend. This engagement has to be broken off, and the Mannerings don't want to be too hard on you. Was it broken through DT or epileptic fits? Sorry, I can't offer you a better exchange unless you'd prefer hereditary insanity. Say the word and I'll tell him it's fits. All Simla knows about that scene on the Lady's Mile. Come. I'll give you five minutes to think over it. During those five minutes I believe that I explored thoroughly the lowest circles of the inferno which it is permitted man to tread on earth. And at the same time I myself was watching myself faltering through the dark labyrinths of doubt, misery, and utter despair. I wondered, as Heatherleg in his chair might have wondered, which dreadful alternative I should adopt. Presently I heard myself answering in a voice that I hardly recognized. They're confoundedly particular about morality in these parts. Give them fits, Heatherleg, and my love. Now let me sleep a bit longer. Then my two selves joined, and it was only I, half-crazed, devil-driven I, that tossed in my bed, tracing step by step the history of the past month. But I am in Simla, I kept repeating to myself. I, Jack Pansy, am in Simla, and there are no ghosts here. It's unreasonable of that woman to pretend there are. Why couldn't Agnes have left me alone? I never did her any harm. It might just as well have been me as Agnes. Only I'd never have come back on purpose to kill her. Why can't I be left alone, left alone and happy? It was high noon when I first awoke, and the sun was low in the sky before I slept, slept as the tortured criminal sleeps on his rack, too worn to feel further pain.